Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome back. Take a seat. We've got an incredible story for you today. There's a battle we're going to be talking about today where the British army lost the most amount of people out of any battle that they've ever fought in history, and that's called the Battle of the Somme. The Battle of the Somme took place during World War I, the first time that the entire world came together in the modern era and fought a war together with modern weapons, modern vehicles, modern technology for the time. It was the first major battle where machine guns were commonly used across all sides. And it was also the first time where chemical warfare became a real thing. The Battle of the Somme is a pretty incredible story. And honestly, the British and the Allied forces, the French too, and the Germans all learned a lot of really hard lessons because nobody had fought a war like this before, like after the industrial age with all this crazy technology and weaponry and the tactics were needing to change. Machine guns had just recently been introduced to be commonplace. People didn't really have tactics for them in like an offensive manner. We had, we had good tactics established for defense because they could set up a machine gun nest in a defensive position but they didn't really know how to integrate machine guns with an offensive formation. There was a lot of hard lessons learned and a lot of people died and a lot of casualties were taken. Anyway, let's get into it. The Battle of the Somme, more than 16 million people died as a result of World War I, including civilians. And the Battle of the Somme is one of the most painful and bitterly contested battles of World War I. It took place from July 1st and lasted until November 18th of 1916. It was a coordinated effort between British and French forces aimed at securing a decisive victory over the Germans on the Western Front. In my opinion, it was probably one of the reasons that Neville Chamberlain did everything he could to avoid getting involved in armed conflict with Germany once they started becoming aggressive in the 1930s. And the reason I say that is because Great Britain lost so many people, like they lost entire towns of people. A large majority of the army at the time was volunteer, which was the first time they had a volunteer force. And so they lost unbelievable levels of people. Just everyone was dying. Tons of people died. There's such a great amount of loss from this war. There was a feeling at Great Britain where they were like, we don't want to get involved in anything else like this ever again, because I don't, we don't know if we can handle that level of loss again. Neville Chamberlain was the prime minister during the beginning part of World War II, but he also was alive for World War I and saw what happened with the massive loss of life that they suffered as a result of the battles that they fought at Verdun and the Battle of the Somme and everywhere else. That's just my personal opinion. Now, World War I began in 1914, and there were tens of thousands of casualties on both sides. By December of 1915, Allied leaders from Britain, France, Italy, Serbia, and Russia decided to meet at the Inter-Allied Conference at Chantilly, Paris to discuss their strategy for the following year. And they decided they needed to launch a combined offensive near the River Somme in summer of 1916. Unfortunately for the Allies, the Germans viciously besieged the French at Verdun in February of 1916, which made the offensive at the Somme even more urgent in order to relieve some of the pressure off the French at Verdun. The British took charge of the main effort in the attack. That offensive wasn't supposed to take place a period of time later, but because of the battle at Verdun happening, they're like, okay, we gotta push this up. We gotta push this up now. We gotta act now. So they were like, all right, fine, let's, let's go ahead and take action. We got to do something. We can't just let them attack for done and not push on this offensive or we're going to start losing seriously. That's when they decided to go ahead and begin this offensive. Before the offensive commenced, the Allies conducted a week-long artillery bombardment from 24 June until 1 July of 1916. They fired over 1,700,000 shells in the hopes that it would soften and destroy the German defenses and obstacle plan. During that same year, the production of artillery shells had skyrocketed in order to meet the demands of the front lines. Over the course of nine months from March 1916 until November of 1916, over 37 million shells were produced. 37 million. That's unbelievable. On the 1st of July, the British 4th Army with 11 divisions composed largely of first-time volunteer soldiers advanced along a 15-mile span north of the Somme River, while five French divisions attacked on an 8-mile span to the south where the German defenses were weaker. Despite the week-long artillery bombardment intended for softening German defensive positions, the Germans maintained a relatively strong center of gravity due to the complex and sturdy nature of their defenses, and also the fact that nearly half of all of the shells they fired 
didn't detonate. I'm going to say that again. Nearly half of the shells they fired in that massive 1,700,000 shell bombardment were duds. That means that 850,000 of those shells got spread all over the battlefield and were just unexploded ordnance, just sitting there, ready to blow up if anybody accidentally fell on one the wrong way. Booby traps. They didn't really have EOD back then, so it kind of is what it is. I'm sure people accidentally kicked them and they probably, there's probably a lot of UXO that went off after that massive bombardment, I'm sure. Now, additionally, when the attack began, the British used artillery to provide creeping fires that slowly approached the German positions to provide some support for the advancing troops. Around 60,000 British troops assaulted the German positions as they advanced in densely packed groups over no man's land. At the time, machine guns were relatively new to modern warfare, so there weren't really any good standing operating procedures for dealing with them just yet, other than using artillery bombardment. As a result, when the British troops attacked the German defensive line, German machine gun and rifle fire absolutely decimated the tightly grouped advancing British troops. Now at the time of the attack, most of the British troops were carrying around 66 pounds of gear on them, which many times was almost half the weight of the average British soldier at the time, because most people back then were pretty malnourished. There wasn't exactly a surplus of chow. Your average man was like 130, 140, you know, it wasn't like everybody is today where it's like everyone's buff, everybody goes to the gym, everybody eats Taco Tuesday. It wasn't like that back then. They didn't have like that much food. So guys were a little smaller. So anyway, since they were wearing about 66 pounds of gear, that was about half their body weight. So they're heavily encumbered, which made maneuvering very difficult. Now, by the end of the first day, a little over 19,000 British Empire soldiers were killed and more than 38,000 were wounded. Marking that first day, of the Battle of the Somme as the bloodiest battle that the British Army has ever suffered through in history. That is unbelievable. 19,000 people died in one day. Think about that for a minute. Your average battalion for the Marine Corps, for example, your average battalion size element is about a thousand people. That's a lot of people. That's a crap ton of dudes. Like that's a full ass auditorium. That's like you go to a basketball game and you got a thousand people watching in an auditorium somewhere. A movie theater is a better example. So like you go to a movie and there's a thousand people in there. That movie theater is packed. And that's just one battalion. Think about this as 19 battalions, 19 movie theaters full of people died on the first day, in one day, in 24 hours. That's unreal, bro. And then more than 38,000 people were wounded. That's another 38 battalions were wounded. And who knows what type of wounds they had. Some of them could have lost limbs from getting like hit by shells that went off. Some guys could have gotten like blinded. Who knows, you know, unbelievable. An interesting story from one of the British lieutenants that was at the battle, a lieutenant named Alfred Bundy. He recalled what he experienced that day and it was passed down over time. Alfred Bundy said, went over top after an interminable period of terrible apprehension. Our artillery seemed to increase in intensity and the German guns opened up on no man's land. The din was deafening. The fumes choking invisibility limited owing to the dust and clouds caused by exploding shells. It was a veritable inferno. I was momentarily expecting to be blown to pieces. My platoon continued to advance in good order without many casualties and had reached halfway to the Bosch line. Suddenly, an appalling rifle and machine gun fire opened against us and my men commenced to fall. I shouted, down! But most of those that were still not hit had already taken cover. I dropped in a shell hole and occasionally attempted to move to my right and left, but bullets were forming an impenetrable barrage and exposure of the head meant certain death. None of our men was visible, but in all directions came pitiful groans and cries of pain. Jesus, bro. Like, imagine you and your platoon are just in no man's land and you're halfway across, nobody's hit yet. And then all of a sudden, a barrage of machine gun fire from hundreds of machine gun nests all open up on you at one time. That would be terrifying. And so you hop in a foxhole somewhere that was probably made from an artillery shell and just hope to God that they don't send their, you know, infantry out to come get you while they're firing 
machine gun rounds at you. Just to reiterate, like, I don't believe that a lot of people carried machine guns with them when they were on the assault at this point. The machine guns were mainly used in a defensive posture during World War One, at least in the beginning. Everyone that was like on the offensive or on the assault just carried regular rifles. It's unfortunate they weren't able to lay down a real good base of fire because they didn't carry machine guns with them at that point because they hadn't developed the tactics for that yet. The British and French forces suffered devastating levels of loss during the first day of the battle, which they made every attempt to learn from in the coming days. General Sir Douglas Haig, who was the commander of the British forces, made the decision to continue attriting the German positions, likely in an effort to reduce pressure on the Allies at Verdun, and so they continued to send smaller attacks over the course of two weeks, which ultimately led to them taking an additional 25,000 casualties. On July 14th, four British divisions attacked Longueval Ridge, while being supported by heavy levels of artillery in the northern Somme. They captured the ridge by mid-morning, and the surprise and momentum allowed them to advance and capture the village of Longueval as well. However, any progress came at a heavy cost, as both sides suffered significant casualties. Over the course of the month of July alone, Germany had lost over 160,000 soldiers, and the British and French had lost over 200,000. The fighting in July was a heavy slog back and forth in a war of attrition, and the amount of ground gained or lost that any given time was minimal. By late August, the British Empire's forces had managed to capture eight square kilometers of previously German-controlled territory, though they took 100,000 casualties to get it. By this point, Germany had lost ground at both the Somme and Verdun, and as a result, Erich von Falkenhayn, who was the commander of the German army at the time, was replaced by Paul von Hindenburg and Erich Ludendorff. This happened due to a loss in trust and confidence in Erich von Falkenhayn's leadership by German high command. Once Erich von Falkenhayn was replaced, the Germans shifted their strategy and decided to fall back and form a new defensive line in order to reinforce and build a more in-depth defense. Their hope was that this strategy would revitalize their posture and result in causing more devastating losses for the British and French forces as they began maneuvering towards their newly established lines. The thing I think about when you go back to that time is how long and how much manpower it took to dig those trenches without backhoes. You're doing it by hand. Imagine, imagine digging trenches out that were 12 feet high, having to do miles of them, and then having to reinforce them with boards and build like dugouts inside so that way you can like have these little bunkers and stuff where people can like go on rest or where you can have like a CP or a communications area or a chow spot or like whatever. On top of all that, they're having to lay out new barbed wire all over the place and having to do it in certain ways that are like tactical in nature that can funnel people. There's all these different ways of laying out barbed wire or sea wire and some of the tactics came from back then. I don't know how much tactics they had for barbed wire back then, but I'm sure that they learned that if they could angle barbed wire in a certain way, they could funnel people into machine gun nests. So they probably did that kind of thing back then, I'm sure. I guarantee there was a lot of battle planning. Like there's a lot of like, hey, we got to figure out where we're going to set our lines up, where we're going to put machine gun bunkers, where we're going to put everything's going to be located, where the artillery is going to be, how far back behind the line the artillery is going to be, all that stuff. One of the most interesting things about this battle is it's the first battle that the British, the Canadians, and the New Zealanders employed tanks for the very first time during this battle on September 15th during the attack at fleur Courcelette. The type of tanks that they were employing were Mark I tanks. And interestingly enough, there was a male version and a female version. Now, the male versions were armed with four machine guns and two six-pounder guns and were more designed with the intent of engaging German positions and obstructing the infantry advance. Now, the female versions had six machine guns and did not have the six-pounder guns. They're mainly intended to be used to protect the male tanks against German infantry. Unfortunately, there were 49 tanks available for this fight. However, only 36 actually made it to their starting points due to the mechanical issues that they were suffering from and breaking down constantly. During this push on September 15th, the British forces were able to maneuver around one and a half miles, but they still ended up taking about 29,000 casualties throughout the back and forth brutal slog. Now, unfortunately, by October, the weather began to worsen, making it more difficult for the Allies to make a big push. And by the time mid-November rolled around, General Sir Douglas Haig called off the offensive, ending the push on November 18th. Since the previous July of that year, the Allies had only managed to move seven miles. It took them over five months to move a mere seven miles. That's it. Seven miles. 
Over a million people were either killed or wounded. That's insane. You gotta think like people were really good at defense because they had they could use artillery, they could use machine guns. Like people were really good at the defense. The offense was always worse for everybody. And there was always heavy casualties every time they went on the offensive because you're just exposed in no man's land, getting shelled and machine gun fire. And meanwhile, your enemy that you're coming after is in defensive positions and trenches where you can't even shoot at them. It was a devastating loss of human life, the whole thing, especially for the British. The British lost more people in the very first day than they had ever lost in the history of the British army. By the end of the battle, the casualty count was estimated to be over 1 million soldiers including over 300,000 deaths, 300,000. That's unbelievable. In five months, 300,000 people died. That's like a small city of people just poof, gone. It's estimated that over 420,000 British Empire soldiers were wounded, including over 125,000 deaths, while the French took roughly 200,000 casualties and Germany took over 450,000 casualties. In the first day alone, some say that there was a casualty every 4.4 seconds, making it the single most bloody battle that the British army had ever endured. Now, despite the massive loss of human life on both sides, this battle likely forced the German military to retreat back to the Hindenburg line in March of the following year in an effort to rest, refit, and fortify new defensive positions rather than continue the vicious slog over the same terrain that they'd been fighting over in the Somme. Some interesting facts about the Battle of the Somme that I think you all will find pretty interesting, that I found interesting, and I figured I would share them with you. An individual who was a corporal in the Bavarian Army at the time was wounded at the Battle of the Somme when a shell exploded at the entrance to a dispatch runner's dugout, sending shrapnel into his left thigh. Apparently, he pleaded and begged not to be casual act out of there, but he ended up being pulled out and sent to the Red Cross Hospital in Belitz in Brandenburg, Germany. He returned five months later to the Western Front. His name was Adolf Hitler. Yep, Adolf Hitler himself was at the Battle of the Somme long before he ever became the prime minister or dictator or whatever. That's pretty ominous. And I know there were, there's a lot of like stories about how there were like soldiers that encountered him that could have taken him out, but didn't and all kinds of other stuff like that. Lots of lore, heavy on the lore. Lore. Another fun fact, Raymond Asquith, who was the son of the British prime minister at the time was killed in action at the battle of the Somme. So even the prime minister's son was lost. I'm sure that was not easy because I guarantee you that that was like public news back then. That's rough. Interestingly enough, the Somme River Valley was actually retaken by the Germans during World War II and occupied from May until June of 1940. So funny, they were forced out of the Somme in World War I and they came right back during World War II and held it again. Pretty ironic. Now the final fun fact that I I'm extra excited to share with you guys is the fact that one of my favorite authors, J.R.R. Tolkien, served in the British Army during World War I and fought during the Battle of the Somme. He even wrote some of the earliest parts of his legendarium found in the Book of Lost Tales Part Two during the time that he spent in the Somme. On July 14th, Tolkien's Sea Company was deployed to the Somme front. He had a five-day period on the front lines during that period of time. His second five-day duty began on July 24th. So fortunately, he wasn't on that first day. Otherwise, I don't know if we would have ended up with the Lord of the Rings or not, but on October 26th, while in reserve, his battalion was inspected by Sir Douglas Haig, the British commander of the Somme. And then the next day, October 27th, Tolkien contracted trench fever, which ended his active service after only five months. Pretty interesting. A lot of people think that J.R. Tolkien wrote the Lord of the Rings and was basing a lot of the lore off of the landscape of World War One, like all the different enemies and like the different factions and like, you know, the allies. I would imagine people would draw the correlation and say like America was like the elves because they tried to abstain from it and didn't come in until the very last second, naturally like what the elves do. You could consider the British like the humans. I don't know who the dwarves would be, maybe the French. Don't take offense to that. I'm not saying French people are short. And Thomas Shelby, I believe fought in the Battle of the Somme if you watch Peaky Blinders. Kitty said that the sweet boy who left never came back. No one came back. Thomas Shelby fought in the Battle of the Somme. Anyway, this was just one of the earliest battles 
a lot of hard lessons were learned here because it was still very early in the war. They had a lot to learn. Chemical weapons hadn't really been introduced just yet. And so like that was a whole nother thing they had to adapt to down the road. The tactics were poor on the offensive side during that period of time. They didn't really understand how to utilize artillery in a way that we do today, or even at, that they figured out later on the war, how they could like support the push and just continually doing a, an artillery bombardment while the attack was going on. And then also doing creeping fires. So that way, you know, as the infantry is advancing, there's like creeping fires in front of them, creeping up on the enemy's positions. So that way, by the time they get there, the troops are right up on their position. You know, there's all kinds of different things that they learned. They took such a devastating amount of casualties during this. They definitely had to change a lot of the, like the tactics because there's no way they could handle that level of casualties every single battle throughout World War One, or they just would have ran out of people. I imagine that they lost a large majority or at least a very large amount of all of the young men of the country, which is something that you see happening in ukraine right now as well because there's just not enough people and then eventually you got a bunch of old men over there because all the young guys have passed away which that's horrible you know the level of casualties that britain faced specifically one of the main reasons i think that neville chamberlain didn't want to get into world war ii that left such a painful mark on the british people and I just don't, I think he was trying to avoid it at all costs because he didn't want to have a repeat of that. There was a lot of other great battles that happened in World War One. Obviously the Battle of Verdun, huge. I talked about the Battle of Bella Wood in a previous video. And there's a lot of other good ones. I'll probably go back and find another battle to, to do a video on because I, I think this stuff is very fascinating and very interesting. And honestly, like World War One, not a lot of people talk about the battles, but they were savage, like savage battles. They deserve some attention. And I, I think that we have a lot that we can learn from them, especially because right now we're seeing trench warfare in Eastern Europe today in 2024. Pretty applicable to today. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed the video. If there's any fun facts about World War I or any fun facts about the Battle of the Somme that any of you know, please put them in the comments. I think other people would find that interesting as well, like any tidbits of information, any fun facts. And let me know if you have any questions about any of this in the comments, or if you have a suggestion for another battle that you think would be cool to cover, let me know in the comments. I appreciate you guys. I hope you enjoyed the video, and we will see you in the next video. Until next time.